When I was young, I wanted to be a rock star. I wanted to be a photographer. I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be Gandhi. I wanted to change the world. I thought if this guy in India can do it, then I can do it. But then along the way of my life, I lost that. I, I was wearing a blindfold. I didn't realize what was important. I didn't realize what my life calling was. I had no meaning in my life. I'd lost passion for life. I was trying to fit into a society that was not what I wanted to be. Fast forward, I'm living in a beautiful place on the water. I have plenty of money in the bank. From the outside world, I would look like a success story. I would look like a guy that would be happy. But I wasn't. I wasn't happy. I wasn't excited about life. I had no meaning. I had no passion. Through Blindfold Magazine, we tell stories of people that do have meaning, have found their meaning, have found their passion, and inspire others. I'm going to tell you the story of three people that found their meaning and their passion. They all found it at a different point in their life. The first found it at a very young age. The second found it after graduating from college. The third found it at a much later date in their life. Nicholas Ferroni is a really good looking guy. Strikingly good looking. So after graduating from college, it wasn't a surprise that Calvin Klein picked him up to be one of their models and put him in ads. And based on being in that ad, a casting agent in Hollywood saw Nick and said, he'd be great for our soap opera, our daytime soap opera, All My Children. So Nick went to Hollywood. He was in an episode of All My Children. He did great. They wanted him to come back and offered him a recurring role as a star on daytime soap. They offered him a lucrative salary. They opened the doors to Hollywood to him. He knew that he would have fortune and fame, which most of us think is important. But at the same time, there was a school opening at the high school that he had gone to for a teacher, for a history teacher. Nick knew at a young age that he wanted to be a teacher. So it was an obvious decision for him to go teach school. Based on that decision, Nick has won numer numerous awards as an educator and now as a historian. He's been on TV many times teaching. Uh, he was also included in a book called 100 Making a Difference alongside Maria Shriver, Michelle Obama, Mark Wahlberg, and many others that you've heard of and some that you haven't. A few weeks ago when I sat down with Nick and talked to him about his decisions and just had a casual conversation, he told me, Jeremy, he said I would have been a terrible actor because it wasn't what I wanted to do. It wasn't my thing. He's like, my friends thought I was crazy. They thought, just go out there and do it for a while. But he knew in his heart that that wasn't for him. I think his kids and his students and his peers would agree that Nick made the right decision. Becoming a school teacher was the thing for him. Rich Roll worked at a high-powered law firm in Los Angeles. Actually, the same law firm that defended O.J. Simpson during his famous murder trial. Rich was driving a Porsche, living in a beautiful house, uh, living the life. From the outside, everyone would think that he had it all. He was also working over 100 hours a week, spending little time with his family, and eating a drive through diet. Basically, anything that he could drive up to in his Porsche and get, that's what he ate. So late one night, watching Law & Order, which was his, his tradition of coming home with his food and watching Law & Order on TV, he started to fall asleep. He woke up. Everybody else in the house had gone to sleep. He decided to walk up the stairs and get into bed. And halfway up the stairs, he almost passed out. He was out of shape. He felt terrible. He, he looked at himself in the mirror and couldn't recognize the person that he was. So the next morning when he woke up, he didn't tell his wife what had happened. He was, he was embarrassed. But he, he asked his wife, he said, listen, you know, I know you do yoga, and I know that you're 
doing these juice cleanses. And I know that I've told you that I think all that stuff is hogwash. You know, I, I went to Stanford University. I'm smarter than you. I know more than you do. So he said to her, I think I'd like to try one of these juice cleanses. I want to do something different. First day, felt terrible. Second day, worse. Third day, I'm going to die. This is the worst thing I've ever done. This is such a dumb decision. Fourth day, starting to turn the corner. It felt a little better. Fifth day, even better. Sixth day, better. Seventh day, he was like, wow, I can't believe it took me this long to start trying this. But he had to go back to work. He had to keep working. He had to keep the wheels going. He had to keep following that path. And so he fell right back into the same things that he had, had been going through before. And he felt like crap. So after a few months, he decided to walk into his boss's office at the law firm and tell him, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. This is not for me. I don't have a plan of what I'm going to do, but I can't do this. His boss understood. His boss said, OK, if this is what you have to do, it's what you have to do. He went home, talked to his wife. She was supportive. His kids were supportive. And he said, you know, if I try this juicing thing, let me maybe take it another step further. And let me try not to eat meat today. So he did it. No meat. Nothing. He was, went vegan for a day, which he laughed about and said, this is, I can't believe I'm doing this. Day two, he does it. Day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven. Day seven hits, he feels like a new person. He can't believe how good he feels. Not only does he feel good, he feels light. He feels all this energy, like he, this nervous energy that he just couldn't sit still. And so he decided to go for a swim. He had been a champion swimmer at Stanford, so that came fairly easy to him. Then his wife bought him a bike, and he started to ride the bike. Then he started to run, which he had never done. And, and not running in Florida on the flatlands, but running in Calabasas, California, and through Topanga Canyon, and through the hills in Los Angeles. And on one particular day, he ran 24 miles. And he looked and he said, I just went 24 miles. I can do this. So he came home completely inspired, and he started looking at triathlons and marathons, and maybe I'll do this. And what he saw was this thing called Ultraman, which is an event in Hawaii that happens once a year. And it's a 6.2-mile swim, a 261.4-mile bike ride, and a 56.2-mile run. It takes two days. So he called. He called the race organizer, and he said, yeah, I'm Rich Roll. I want to do this event. And the person laughed and, and said, well, Rich, you, know, you have to apply. And you know, what have you done in the past? And you, know, you have to build up to this. And Rich said, no, I want to do it now. Like, I, 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 let's go. And uh, the person said, well, you've never done anything. And he said, yeah, but I can do this. And so after a lot of coercing, he was able to get into the event. The event only takes 35 people a year. So that alone, the persistence of getting in was a huge thing. Rich did the event. He finished the event. And he felt even more amazing. It was at that point that he realized, between the 24-mile run and this event, that he had found his calling. And he knew that his calling was to go out and teach people, regardless of your ability, your age, you can do these things if you really try. Rich is no different than anyone in this room, anyone in the world. And if you push yourself, you can do that. And so now he travels the world doing motivational speaking. He's written a book called Ultraman. He's an inspiration to everybody. And I think that his kids and his wife would agree that Rich made the right decision when he quit his job. Not only for him, but for his kids as well and his wife. Alexandra Russell graduated from college, went back to where she had grown up in Washington, D.C., and got a job working at an organization that helped women, underprivileged women from the U.S. and from outside of the U.S., uh, teach them living skills, how to cope in a world. She worked with one particular girl and, and grew a bond a very tight bond. 
when the woman went back to her country in Latin America, Alex stayed in contact. And when the girl called her, the woman called her and said, hey, I have my 14-year-old my daughter is going to be coming to the United States. And she's going to be there on this particular day at your organization to learn the skills that I learned. That day came and went, and the girl didn't show up. Alex called the mom and said, hey, your daughter, she never showed up. Where is she? And the woman did not seem worried and said, oh, it's OK. She'll be there in a few days. Or she'll show up. She's probably at her friend's. But the girl had no friends in the United States. She knew no one. Four days later, the girl did show up, completely shooken, not herself, even though Alex didn't know her. She knew that this is not, doesn't seem right. And so she tried to build a bond with the girl. And after a few days, she was able to get the girl to trust her. And, and the girl did open up to her and told her, my mom sold me to a brothel in North Carolina. Alex was floored. When she told me this story, I was floored. She didn't know what to do. She went to the police. The police said, well, we can't really get involved. This isn't our issue. She went to other groups. Well, this isn't really our issue. Finally, she was able to get the FBI involved, and the FBI did go and shut the organization down. This only spurred Alex to look deeper into her life and look deeper into human trafficking and modern day slavery. And what she found was that Thailand is notoriously the worst country in the world for this type of behavior. So she raised some money. She went with a group that dealt with modern day slavery to Thailand and did a tour. And on her tour, one night, they were walking through an area in Bangkok. She looked over to the right, and she saw a red light district. And she said, well, what's down there? I want to go see that. And the guide said, no, don't worry about that. That's not important. But she knew that it was important. So that night, she ventured off by herself, a young, beautiful girl, and went down into this area and walked into a bar and sat down. And what she saw was Western men in this bar with young boys. So she stayed, and she had one of the boys came over and said, you shouldn't be here. This isn't for you. And she said, no, I'm staying here. I'm, I'm staying. And she had a conversation, and they actually played Jenga. They played the board game or the stack game. And the other boys came over because they were interested. Who's this, this girl that would come in here? Who would be brave enough to come into this area? And so she continued to go. Each night of her tour, she went back. And she asked the guide, why didn't you take us there? And the guide said, because I told you it's not important. They're all going to die anyhow. No one cares about the boys. And she found that the boys had been sold by their villages, poor villages where they didn't have any money. So this was their source of income, was to sell the boys. Alex went back to the United States, back to her comfortable life. She didn't feel right. The things that were important to her friends weren't important to her. They talked about movies and fashion and these things, and all Alex could think of was the first little boy and the rest of the boys. So she decided to go on a fundraising mission, and she started raising money for these boys. And when her mission fell short, her husband jokingly said, you should sell your wedding ring. And he kind of laughed. And the next day, she sold her wedding ring. And she raised enough money to go back and take care of these little boys. That was four years ago. She now has had a shelter where boys can come and, and get away from the men. And there's 40 boys that come there on a regular basis. And, and Alex says that each day the boys spend away from these men is a victory. And she's right. And I think those boys would agree that she did the right thing, that she found her meaning, her passion, and it's those boys. When I was young, my dad used to tell me all the time, you can be whatever you want to be, whatever, as long as you're happy doing it. So I would tell you now, if you're not following your passion, if you're not following your meaning, chasing your 
goals, what you really want, you're doing everyone around you a disservice. But more importantly, you're doing yourself a disservice. I would tell you all to find your passion, chase your dreams, never give up on any of those. I would tell you all to take it off and see beyond the blindfold. Thank you. <laughs>